Hi folks, so I was originally doing a little bit of research for another video that I'm going to be working on in the future. It's basically going to be around open source AI, large language models, that kind of thing. And it is actually interesting enough, quite promising. I've been just trying out things with, with the various different language models, uh, you know, alternative out, alternatives out there, particularly the open source ones, of course. And whilst it looks like they may not necessarily be as sophisticated as uh, maybe your GPT-4. A lot of the time, they don't necessarily need to be. My biggest concern about AI was that it's a technology that requires servers and energy on such a level that it prices anyone who is not associated with the big, you know, giant corporations, uh, you know, out. It pushes them out. It pushes them out of trouble. Like they're, they're, This is a type of technology that is used to secure the strength and uh, position of already gigantic uh, corporations, the likes of, of Google and and Microsoft. And I imagine Amazon probably have an open, uh, not an open AI, a um, AI of sorts uh, in the works too. So the open source offering, there is promise there. And I'm actually very, very relieved and excited to find out that, act that we, we may have more autonomy in this equation, in this development of new technology than we previously thought, that it doesn't necessarily automatically take servers the size of warehouses to actually come up with something different. Open source never fails to find, to, to almost like re-innovate, to take an idea that, um, that corporations have basically came up with and find a way where we, you know, normal grassroots people can actually like make use of it without actually having to rely on the corporations. It's the wonders of open source. So I've been trying it out and I've been having a chat with uh, this particular one here, Open Chat 3.57 BQ4. Uh, this is an open source one. There are a few to choose from, and some of them specialize in, you know, some specialize in, in language, some specialize in programming, some spe specialize in calculations. So there, there may require a little bit more attention to be paid to which model you use for which circumstances and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I think that suits the open source world quite well. We don't necessarily need a piece of technology to work as well as, as these massive gigantic corporate counterparts we just need something that's that's good enough we are willing to uh to make the best of, of whatever tools that we have at our disposal and that can allow us a lot more human autonomy that can give us the inside track on occasion so anyway with that little ramble aside and feel free to let me know if you disagree or if you if if you think this fails to address any of the concerns of of ai because it might address some concerns and not others and all that kind of stuff but that aside, uh, I'm just looking at the raw technology today. Hello, and and uh, basically, I am uh, having a chat here, a very brief chat with 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 Open Chat 35 30 3.57 BQ4. So I go, hello, um, how's your day going? That's usually my opener for whatever to test the the open source model to see how they react to it. One of them, I can't remember which one it was, says, "I am a computer. I do not experience days." But I hope you're having a good one. And it's kind of weird. This one is 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 uh, sort of what you'd expect out of ChatGPT. And then I say, do you like being open source? Yes, I appreciate being open source. It allows me to be accessible to a wide range of people and help with various tasks and questions. Being open source also encourages collaboration, improvement, and innovation. Oxford comma, like that, uh, among developers who contribute to my code. Wonderful. Okay. That is a sort of, again, an answer that I would would kind of expect. It's generic, it's broad, it's maybe something that is akin to a dictionary definition. Again, we're not necessarily expecting genuine intelligence out of an AI model. We're talking about a language model here. So what can it recall? What information is it trained on? Because personally, whenever I use AI, I tend to use it for like very menial tasks that I can't be bothered to write a bash script for. So for example, uh, or, or to, to write a, like a substantial command line for, which might be considered by most uh, greybeards to be the, the best way of, of dealing the task. And if I had, like, the knowledge, have you ever tried using the rename command for anything more than just renaming a few things? It's so complicated with so much punctuation. When you can just fire up Jan and you can say, for example, uh, some some of the things I've, I've done is, is can you uh, put comma, you know, can you comma separate a list? So I'll give them a, like a, a give the AI a list of bullet points. Can can I have this as 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 a, you know comma separated 
list rather than a uh, bullet separated list and all that kind of stuff it's very good for doing like repetitive tasks things like that uh also it, you know as a professional writer i write things according to style guides so if for example there is one uh publication or something that i'm writing for where the style guide is we're going to open quotations with a colon and then double quotation marks whereas another might be we're going to introduce a quote with a comma and then open quotation marks double quotation marks for example you can replace the, it's, it's very good for like a search and replace but for things that are slightly more complicated than search and replace it's very good for like checking uh grammatical errors and things like that because you can ask it can you point out all the gra grammatical errors in a piece of text rather than just straight out co um, correcting them and for the most part with exceptions it's quite good at those kind of tasks i also quite like it because it can sort of grade your your writing as well it can say well look not necessarily in a formal capacity but it tells you where where you've gone wrong where it thinks you've gone right and yes it does point out on occasion uh various different uh, grammatical circumstances incorrectly like there are cases where yes there should be a comma here or you know it will on occasion misinterpret phrases but for the most part for the menial tasks for uh an extra layer of of uh, you know an extra pair of eyes of sorts it's it's it does have its uses where i feel that it does break down in terms of its uses is where people start turning to AI language models as a source of information. In my opinion, you you always have to provide the information that you're working with, and it just uses the language model as a way of of contextualizing the tasks that it needs to do. That's just how I you know how I've interpreted it, how I've I've benefited from it. But if you are expecting any AI language model to have information that you don't or don't have access to you are on you know like do not expect it to provide you with any kind of like meaningful information you have to do that bit yourself but it can organize things it can structure things um it can it can simplify things it can summarize there's a lot of things it can do that i do think have some value and i like that open source is moving in this in direction maybe firefox should be considering something like this when they talk about the ai hype train that they're going on but quite frankly let's be honest let's maybe firefox focus on the browser for a while I don't know. although actually side note firefox relay where you have where you can use the sort of not disposable email address but you can use email forwards so that if you're signing up to for example a shopping website you're a bit worried that they might sell your email address on or send you lots of spam you can then use a uh, firefox relay address where it will where you can close it off or if they do decide to abuse your your email that you gave to them it gives you an alternative email that you can cut off at any moment it also does have some it does have like a a way it claims to have a way of like uh, blocking promotional emails but allowing other ones through i don't know how well that works because as it currently stands i've not had too much of a problem with spam these days fingers crossed um but uh and it might be it might be because i use a, a very good uh, email service provider postio i do recommend them you do have to pay for them it's a euro a month but it is very much worth it and i do recommend people actually pay for email but that's just my uh my little uh my little soapbox i got on there anyway so seems to be very very um very pleased that this, this ai here is is open source so I, I asked then, what are the disadvantages of the open source model? And this was quite interesting. I didn't really quite know what to expect. But it has given us five arguments, which I will talk a little bit about today. Uh, or I will argue with. I, I've, I've already kind of expected that the title of this video is going to be Chris Argues with an AI. Um, but I have heard these talking points before, and I think it is quite interesting to... Um, go over them and, and rehearse our talking points right so first uh first uh argument lack of support since the uh, software is free there might be limited or no official customer support for users who encounter issues or need assistance with specific tasks again this one very easily debunked freeware exists there is a lot of proprietary software out there that is given away for free with no support whatsoever whether or not it's open source is completely irrelevant for the most part the source is at the behest of the community 
that's not always to say you actually that's not even always true as well there are many corporate projects that offer paid support um I'm, I'm thinking like red hat i think probably seuss and, and canonical they have like a landscape thing there is support available for open source uh there's a, a support available for for example wordpress now you can go to the, the one of the most common pieces of open source uh software wordpress used to to host blogs websites basically the internet's practically running on wordpress wordpress is owned and maintained by a corporation called automatics which recently of course bought tumblr uh, a lot of people aren't too happy with automatics right now but uh, automatics do offer support for the services they provide you just have the option to take the source code and run it yourself here's where it gets a bit more interesting let's say i uh, buy some some uh hosting from a from a company and they offer for example wordpress hosting now wordpress are not necessarily offering the support from the hosting service but the company that i might be buying that hosting service from would be providing support there as well so not only does the open source model have mechanisms for offering support it has the potential of offering a wider range of support or a um or, or, or support that's even closer to your particular use cases as well, like more customized support, more flexible support. There is also, uh, in many cases, a community behind pieces of software that do offer help. But of course, it could be problematic to consider that a, an, a, a real avenue support, it's really just people's goodwill and kindness. And I don't, I don't know if that's, that, and that's, that's never something to be lent on as support, right? You don't really want to rely on people's goodwill to necessarily, um, you know, count that as, as support. You certainly wouldn't want to run a business on it or anything like that. So, but that being said, it is factually incorrect, number one. Okay, number two, security risks. With the open source model, anyone can... Uh, anyone can view and modify the source code. While this transparency can lead to faster identification and resolution of vulnerabilities, it also means that the malicious actors could potentially exploit the code for nefarious purposes. This is actually a fair point, and it does actually caveat that by saying it can also mean that open source uh, code is is more secure because it does allow vulnerabilities to be found faster. A lot of people will be quick to say security through obscurity is not security. I think a lot of it, some of it is, is, is context dependent, but I think that it's a valid point that, uh, that relying on your source software to be closed doesn't automatically make it any more secure. Uh, there are many ways of, of reverse engineering code. God, the open source world knows that, where uh, you can also find malicious uh, bugs and stuff, or b bugs that can be used maliciously by malicious actors. So, Yes, uh, it is technically possible that someone, and has happened where someone might take a piece of open source software, they might slip in some malware, maybe some like a secret Bitcoin miner or something like that, uh, and then put it out onto an app store uh, as, you know, posing as the official uh, app itself. And and then it can find ways of, of installing malware on your operating system or allow your system um, to be accessed by malicious actors. This, of course, uh, can be and has been uh, addressed by having open source projects verified and directly uh, uploading uh, and supplying binaries of open source pieces of software themselves. So on a day-to-day -day basis, this isn't a problem. So for example, if you're using app images in Linux, well, you can get them directly off the developer and the developer's website. That's generally pretty safe. That's more to do with common sense and just knowing what it is that you're downloading. Um, but, you know, you if you are on their official website and you can check that, I feel that that's generally uh, pretty safe. Um, but there are also ways like, for example, Flathub. That's not too bad. Or your distro's repositories, they can also be really, really quite good. Now, distros do vary slightly on this. So, for example, Arch maintainers, as I understand it, typically they when they compile the binaries for their operating system, they do so so that it's uh, like as per the developer instructions almost. Whereas Debian, for example, they will often sort of change a few maybe defaults in a lot of the stuff that's packaged in the Debian repositories. They might turn off telemetry by default or they might not even allow telemetry. They might not compile the certain blobs that are not necessarily uh, free and open source enough. 
Again, this all comes into when you choose your Linux distribution as to what you want to play with. Also, there are different ways of getting this, like the same piece of software. There are various different package managers as well as um, as well as your, your distro repositories as well. So, uh, all in all, it's it's like it's it's but it's no like yes, there is a potential avenue for security risks, but no more though than security risks for any other kind of software. And quite frankly, whenever I've personally had any kind of security breaches in my day to day life, it's always been phishing. It's always been like I've mistyped something in the URL and just like rolled with it that way. It's usually been my own fault. Uh, it's usually been something, you know, it, the, the problem is exists between computer and chair. Um, and there is never, ever, ever, ever any substitute for common sense, vigilance and good habits. Um, and that applies to open source and, and everything else as well. Okay, maintenance. Open source projects rely on community of volunteers for ongoing development, support and maintenance. If key contributors leave or lose interest, the project may stagnate or even become abandoned. Uh, yes, and it also may become unabandoned as well. Like uh, it allows like the code there maybe might be rotting away in a repository somewhere on GitHub, GitLab or uh, Gitty, Codeberg, SourceForge, whatever. But someone can then pick it up and fork it and create something new uh, open source projects get picked up all the time code gets borrowed when a proprietary piece of software dies a lot of the time the code dies with it in fact there's many pieces of uh, software uh, proprietary software where the code has just been lost over time so again i i I, th I think this one might be the weakest of the arguments because it, yes you do need like because a lot of cases, uh, open source projects don't rely on volunteers. A lot of open source projects, there are a lot of people working professionally on the Linux kernel uh, and other big projects. But yes, there are a lot of uh, volunteer and unpaid uh, d developers working in, in the uh, Linux community. Yes, sometimes smaller projects do uh, lose mo momentum. One of the w the projects that I wish sort of had more momentum was the Tox protocol, the peer-to-peer -peer instant messaging protocol. I thought that could genuinely solve so many problems, not necessarily just security-based problems, but you look at like uh, companies like Signal that do a instant messaging platform that is generally hailed as being very good uh, for the most part. It's still a centralized service. It's still kind of only open source in name. It is it, it functions much more as a proprietary piece of software in a lot of cases, although it does allow its encryption um, methodology or its, its encryption algorithm or th its encryption technology uh, to be used by anyone that needs to use it. So, for example, WhatsApp uses the signal encryption um, as part of it. And I believe that Facebook, the parts of Facebook that are using end-to-end uh, -end encryption also use it. So it is providing a net good through the mechanism of open source, but it's not like you can run your own signal server. It's not like you can make your own signal client. There are reasons for that. They say that they want to have that full control over the end-to-end -end pipeline from app to server and app, just so that they can lock down any bugs and security as soon as possible which is a little bit leaning into some of the fallacious arguments made previously in this AI post. And I think that with Tox, the ability for people to make their own clients, uh, the ability for it to be genuinely peer to peer, so that it doesn't require on, on a server, because the thing about Signal is that running a centralized service is very, very, very expensive to the point where really the only infrastructure I see that does it easily and reliably and without too much problem, particularly for smaller projects, would be like IRC. And that only does text and a basic form of text at that, which I think is good. But um, Tox allows for private instant messaging, end to end encrypted, all the rest, but it's genuinely, you know, uh, peer to peer. So that does mean that you have to be online the same time the person you're talking to. But guess what, we've got things like email for asynchronous communication. So anyway, a little bit of a ramble there. But uh, maintenance, okay. Uh, if key could uh, lose interest, da 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 da. Right. Um, so uh, yes, but any project could become abandoned. Um, services can become abandoned. Oh my God, we're looking at live service games and stuff like that, which I know you folks are not playing live service games because I, you know, you're not you're not that audience. Maybe one or two of you might, but live service games are falling like flies because they 
people only have enough time for one and people aren't going to play monthly subscriptions for any more than like one game that they're playing at times ridiculous to think otherwise and that's just the greed of, of video game corporations at play right here they're going to eat themselves alive just watch it you know it you know it i'm not telling you nothing you don't already know so fifth and final point licensing complexity open source projects often use various licenses to govern how their code can be used modified and distributed this can lead to confusion around rights and responsibilities of users and developers in different situations again 99.9 uh, percent of times that's that's zeroth of an issue that's not an issue uh, if you are a developer or you are an artist of any kind you can if you wanted to have like the freest license for available public domain that's fine uh, there are of course more or less permissible licenses than that but like if you don't care to understand the legalese of it all but you want to make something for the common good sure uh public domain it's not like creative commons is difficult to get your head around either yes you do need to like uh, read the license that you're releasing it under but it's very 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 human readable gpl bsd mit apache licenses uh, they're all very easy to understand. I'm sorry, but like if you are if you're capable of developing a piece of software, you are capable of reading a short document that explains rights. Let me know if you are like let me know if I'm wrong on that. Let me know if you're a great developer that have ne has never managed to get your head around uh like what the GPL license means. But I I don't think that 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 such people exist, right? Um and yeah, like I've seen code released under Creative Commons before, and that's that's fine right that might not necessarily be a uh free software foundation blessed uh you know legal uh document or whatever it is but like uh, or license but it, it's it's still in the it's still in the a good spirit it's still in the spirit of open source and all that kind of stuff i've really stuff under public uh domain before i personally like the creative commons share alike non-commercial uh, if i'm doing something that's a bit of a labor of love i don't like the non-commercial part i suppose really like as you know if you, as the rights holder you can allow i believe you can allow exemptions to that um although it may be something like in court where you have to apply intellectual property and copyright consistently i don't know not a lawyer not legal advice uh but needless to say the actual uh text of of licenses yes people who are not familiar with computers might struggle to understand it and 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 maybe i can you know maybe that's that's a great idea for another video where i just go go to people that are maybe less techy and see if they can understand the gpl but in reality i think i think I, it's very rare that i hear people going oh i don't know what license to you know license stuff under because at the end of the day you know i i have a preference i like the gpl i like the agpl i also like creative commons but but i understand that like mit or apache license or even the do whatever the fuck you want with it license like these are fine these are these are fine licenses to release stuff under like it's 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 splitting hairs at this point so so there we go that's five reasons five disadvantages of open source debunked uh which i thought would be just a nice little rambly video for you folks today and of course this video is going up on the fediverse first it's going up on hamish's uh peer tube server so as always uh thank you to hamish for, for allowing me to host these videos on on his server if you do want to support the content that i make here on the fediverse uh really the best place is is just to give the money to hamish because he's supporting a small community a community of creators here myself is one of them and um, this stuff isn't free you know we're not funded by google we're not funded by big corporations we're basically funded by a ko-fi account and and you know hamish's generosity at this stage so um thank you very much for for the support in actually getting my videos out there to you and of course if you're watching this on youtube um hello i guess i like leave a comment but um peertube the fediverse the open source world like you should check it out it's really good it's really good so anyway that's about it for me today you will um you will see a little bit more from jan in the future um so yes um do you, i'm just gonna put one one more thing in just so you can still see it in action a little bit of a bonus do you like linux question mark generating response sometimes it can take a while you might actually start hearing the uh the fans shoot up 
Um, yep, I can hear it. I don't know if the if the mic's sort of cutting it out now, so it doesn't always necessarily take as quick a time as it should do. Are you gonna? There we go. Yes. I appreciate seeing it, Linux and the open source software ecosystem it supports. Oh, oh. So as you can see, it's a little bit slower and, um, than than what you might expect from ChatGPT. Uh, I don't. Well, I'm also like recording and doing a whole bunch of other stuff. So I, if the recording's all, all gone a bit squiffy because all of my um, all of my resources are now being used to 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 answer this question. In fact, I might even I might even just stop it there. But as you can tell, like it's a lot slower, but and it and it does use like all of your computer resources, which is why I just stopped it there. Uh, there are smaller models. You know, you could choose your model depending on 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 research. And there are some models. I think I got like thirty two gigs of RAM here. So that's what you that's like par for a desktop, would you say? Um, and there are models, there are AI models that are too uh, resource hungry to actually run on this machine. And fortunately enough, the actual application that I'm using is um, uh, it tells you if you've got enough, you know, it tells it tells you if you fit the recommendations. And they've got like, they've got a nice little, uh, they got a nice little place where you can sort of download and, and learn about all the different uh, different types. You can, in fact, plug it into um, OpenAI ChatGPT uh, if you have access to an API code, which I think you need to be part of, like a premium member for that kind of stuff. But uh, but there you go. So th I think there's promise there. Uh, don't forget, these things are only in the process of getting better. But I think that this is actually something that really kind of, um, yeah, is, is optimism. It's good, right? It's a step in the right direction. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. That's about it from me today. Please feel free to leave a uh, thought in the comment section below. Also, 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 I've got to do a thumbnail for this video. And I kind of want like, you know, in the theme of this channel, I kind of want to be like transparent. So I'm going to pose for a thumbnail. You're going to see it. Like I, so, so the, the 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 video is going to be called like Chris argues about open source with an open source AI or something like that. So so I'm going to be like something like that. That's going to be like that's going to be like that's going to be that's going to be it. You, you'll see the, the the thumbnail. It'll be, it'll be good. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. That's about it for me today. Until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Toodaloo.